Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 40. In this lecture, we'll discuss thermal expansion. This topic is covered in Chapter 19 of our textbook by Surway and Jouet. Thermal expansion is a fact of life. Observational evidence suggests that whenever the temperature of an object changes, its size also changes. This change in the size of an object in response to the change in the temperature of the object is referred to as thermal expansion. Thermal expansion happens for all phases of matter, whether solid, liquid, or gas, but it's often most noticeable when it happens to solid. To better understand thermal expansion on a microscopic basis, we first have to realize that the atoms or molecules of an object always have minute amounts of random motion regardless of the temperature of the object. This is true even of solids. So even if you look at a solid piece of steel, the atoms and molecules in that piece of steel have some amount of random motion. They don't stray very far from their equilibrium positions, but they do tend to oscillate by small amounts relative to that equilibrium position. Now, it turns out when one increases the temperature of an object, one is essentially increasing the speed of atomic motion. So in a few lectures, we'll actually develop the exact relationship between speed and temperature. But for now, it suffice it to understand that when something gets hotter, its atoms begin to move faster. And when something gets colder, its atoms or molecules begin to move more slowly. Now, this increase in the speed of the atoms results in an increase in the atomic separation. So as the atoms or molecules begin to move faster, they collide with each other with more force, pushing each other apart. That increases the separation between neighboring atoms. As that happens, the overall size of the object increases, resulting in the situations depicted in the pictures below. Of course, we want to understand thermal expansion on a quantitative level. More precisely, we want to be able to calculate the change in the length of an object in response to a change in its temperature. To do that, suppose we have an object, let's say a rod, at some initial temperature T sub i. Let's say the initial length of the rod is L sub i. We now heat this rod and raise its temperature to some final temperature, which we'll call T sub F. At that final temperature, the rod will have some final length L sub F, and L sub F will be greater than L sub I by some amount, which we're calling delta L. So in the picture here, delta L is essentially this distance here. To calculate delta L, we'll need this equation. Delta L, that is the change in the length of the rod, is equal to some constant alpha times the initial length of the rod times the change in the temperature of the rod. The constant that appears in the front is known as the length coefficient of thermal expansion, and it's a constant that depends on the material or the substance of the rod, so it's different for different materials. Invar, for example, is an alloy of nickel and iron, and is famous for having a very small coefficient of thermal expansion. Its alpha is 0.9 times 10 to the minus 6. Pyrex glass has a coefficient of 3.2 times 10 to the minus 6, while ordinary glass has a coefficient that is almost three times as large as Pyrex glass. This difference explains why it is relatively safe to put a Pyrex glass dish inside an oven, but it is somewhat dangerous to heat ordinary glass inside an oven. When you place a dish made of ordinary glass inside an oven and you heat it, the dish expands and that large expansion creates stresses in the dish that eventually crack the glass. Aluminum is a metal with many nice properties. It is relatively cheap, it is relatively lightweight and very strong. One of its drawbacks is that it has a relatively large coefficient of thermal expansion. 
So in industrial applications where you want to minimize thermal expansion, you should probably build your objects not from aluminum, but perhaps of invar. In using this equation, remember to use the correct units. Delta T should always be in Kelvin or Celsius and never in Fahrenheit. Recall that in our last lecture, we discussed how these different temperature scales have different zeros, and therefore a change in degrees Kelvin is not necessarily equal to a change in degrees Fahrenheit. So as you plug numbers in here, be careful about the units that you're using for temperature. Thermal expansion doesn't just change the length of an object, it really changes all dimensions of an object. So uh, the area and the volume of objects change as well. For example, we could talk about the change in the volume of an object in response to a change in its temperature. As before, imagine you have some object, this time we had a three-dimensional object at some initial temperature Ti with some initial volume V sub i. Here you can imagine that this is, let's say, a block of aluminum, and we're going to heat this block of aluminum to some final temperature T sub f. As we raise the temperature, the volume increases. At this final temperature, we'll call the final volume V sub f. The difference between the initial and the final volume will be delta V. Delta V is given by this formula here. Once again, we have a constant in front. We multiply that by the initial volume of the object. We multiply that by the change in temperature, and we get the change in volume of the object. The constant in front, beta, is known as the volume coefficient of thermal expansion, on the previous slide, we were talking about the length coefficient of thermal expansion. This is the three-dimensional volume coefficient. Here I'm giving you the coefficient of thermal expansion for several other materials. Notice that thermal expansion does not apply just to solids. Air also expands, and its beta is 3.67 times 10 to the minus 3. Liquids like alcohol, mercury, and gasoline can also expand, and each one of those materials has its own volume coefficient of thermal expansion. Once again, be careful about how you use this equation when you are given temperatures and you're asked to calculate the change in temperature. If you want to use this equation, you should convert all of the temperatures to Kelvin or Celsius, and as a general rule, you should stay away from Fahrenheit. So we talked about how the length of an object changes and how the volume of an object changes in response to changes in the temperature of the object. And you may have noticed that the two formulas that I gave you for length changes and volume changes were quite similar. That makes sense because after all, a change in volume is really just three length changes. So when we talk about, for example, the change in the volume of this cube here, what we're really talking about is a change in its length and a change in its width and a change in its height. What this means is that there must be some important relationship between our formula for length changes and our formula for volume changes. To see that relationship, let's start as follows. We'll express the final volume of this object as its final length times its final width times its final height. Now we can look at each one of these essentially as a length, and we know that each one of those lengths is going to uh, change in response to a change in temperature. So we can say that L final is equal to L initial plus some delta L, and that delta L, of course, as we saw earlier, is alpha L initial times delta T. So this quantity here is simply the change in the length of the cube. This quantity here, of course, is just the change in the width of the cube, and this quantity here is just a change in the height of the cube. You can see that all three dimensions are changing in essentially the same way. The only difference is that we're replacing length with width or height.
Now to simplify the expression, let's factor out the L initial from this first term. Let's factor out the width initial from this second term. And let's factor out the height initial from the third term. This is what we get when we factor out those terms. These three terms here, of course, just give us the initial volume of the cube since we're just multiplying the initial length, initial width, and initial height. When we multiply out everything else, this is what we get. We now have the initial volume times this relatively complicated expression. Now recall from the tables that I showed you that alpha is usually a relatively small number. For most of the substances that I showed you, alpha was some number times 10 to the minus 6. And of course, you know what happens when you take a small number and raise it to the second power or the third power, you get an even smaller number. So if you take 0.1 and you square it, you get 0.01. And if you cube it, you'll get 0.001. So small numbers tend to become even smaller when you square them or cube them. What that means is that this term here is very nearly equal to zero, and so is this term here. What that means is that we can essentially ignore these terms, certainly for small temperature changes of only 10 or 15 degrees, alpha delta t squared is going to be an exceedingly small number. So we're going to approximate the final volume simply as the initial volume times 1 plus 3 alpha delta t. Distributing the v initial into the parentheses, this is the expression that we get. And now we're beginning to see what delta v is. Notice we have v final is equal to v initial plus some quantity. This quantity here must be the change in the volume of this cube. But of course, we learned earlier on the previous slide that delta v must equal to beta v initial delta t. Setting these two expressions equal to each other, we find that beta must be approximately equal to 3 times alpha. So linear expansion and volume expansion are in fact related in a relatively straightforward way. If you know the linear or length coefficient of expansion for a material, you can calculate the volume coefficient of expansion by simply taking alpha and multiplying it by 3. Let's end this lecture with a practice problem. A 250 meter long bridge consists of two spans of concrete placed end to end so that no room is allowed for expansion. If a temperature increase of 20 degrees Celsius occurs, what is the height y to which the spans rise when they buckle? The coefficient of thermal expansion for concrete is 12 times 10 to the minus 6. So the situation is depicted here. We have two solid segments or spans of concrete that, is, that are placed next to each other side by side without a gap in between them. Now this is not a problem at temperature T, but as we raise the temperature, for example, as the ambient temperature rises on a hot day, then the lengths will also increase. Since there's no room for thermal expansion, these two spans will push against each other and they will rise up. This is what we're describing as a buckling of the two spans. Now, naively, you might think that this change in height is not very much. Perhaps y is equal to just a few millimeters, so that when cars drive over this bridge, they'll barely notice the buckling. As you will soon see, that's not true. This buckling could be quite significant. To figure out why, we want to figure out the final length of each one of these spans. So concentrating on just one length of concrete, we can calculate its final length as follows. The final length of just one span is equal to the initial length plus delta L. We have a formula for delta L. We know that the length changes according to this formula, alpha times the initial length times delta T. Delta T is going to be 20 degrees. L initial 
is the length of one of these stretches or spans of concrete, so it will be 125 meters. Plugging those numbers in, we find that the final length of one span is going to be 125.03 meters. Now what we're really interested in is, is in the height y, and what we know is that the initial length here, this distance, was equal to 125 meters. We also know that this distance here is the final length, which is equal to 125.03 meters. To figure out why, we simply need to calculate the third leg of a right triangle. For that, you could use the Pythagorean theorem, and you will find that y is equal to the square root of L final squared minus L initial squared. Plug those numbers in and you will find that y is approximately equal to 2.7 meters. So when these two spans uh, buckle, they rise not just by a very small amount, they rise by a very noticeable 2.7 meters. That's uh, significantly taller than the average person. And that's why if you've ever looked at a bridge up close, you've probably noticed something like the gap depicted here. Separate spans of a bridge are often allowed to expand by a couple of centimeters to avoid this type of buckling. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.